Hello everyone, my name is Ash, and welcome to... It's practically Emmy Squared, <laughs> because it's Masked Empire, and then it's Mass Effect. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, today we're going to be reading Chapter 3 of The Masked Empire. If you don't know, you can go to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash LadyXInsanity, and you can see, read, listen to chapter one and two if you don't know it's by patrick weeks and also you can get it at any retailer you can get it at amazon barnes and noble borders if it's still alive <laughs> and yeah so let me see here oh of course i'm really smart and i decided to i am not prepared for today why is this <laughs> Here, I want you guys to see yourself, so give me a hot second here. Do 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 that's a wrong game. I why am I singing that? <laughs> awesome. Alright, so if you don't know from chapter two at the end of chapter two, we saw Sarah Michelle and uh Melkindar decided to Send him a letter asking him to come down to some shady pub and be like, Hey, let's meet. Well, you didn't know it was Melkinder, but now he knows. And then he goes, Why did you bring me here? Blah, blah, blah. And she goes, Well, GG. Because <laughs> the last one was... The last few sentences were basically her going, Sir Michael, Michelle, you have already delivered it. So that's where we're at right now. And we'll be reading chapter 3 today, and then I'll take a small little break, and then we'll do Mass Effect Multiplayer. Uh, the way that Mass Effect Multiplayer is going to work is that today, <laughs> my Xbox is red ringed, so it'll have to be on PC and not Xbox, and I'll try to figure out if I can get that fixed. But anyway, yeah. So we'll start with The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks, and it'll be chapter 3. Michelle listened to the metallic hiss of blades coming out of the best of the scabbards behind him. Six, he asked the bard. She smirked. Seven. But who's counting? Michelle spun, kicked the chair at the men behind him, and moved. His blade, not his formal blade, but a red steel longsword that was good enough to use, but simple enough to avoid attention, slid out of his sheath and into the man first man's throat into a flawless execution of duelist catches and apples. None of the men had even moved yet, and as the shot cry went up, Michel shouldered the dying man into one of his comrades, then stabbed through him and into the other man with perfectly aimed thrust he learned from the second shield. Both men, ye both, both men fell as Michel yanked his blade free. Sorry. Seven was now five. Melkinder had drawn a dagger, but kept well back from the melee. The rest were moving now, swinging in at him, and Michelle drove into their mist. He batted down most of the strikes on the right with a great sweeping blow, took one of the reinforced forearm of his jacket on the left, and broke through the circle where they tried to pin him. No second blade. So much of Bear Mauls the Wolves didn't apply. He kicked his fallen chair to the left to slow the men down, then moved right holding his long sword with both hands as he swung low at the nearest enemy's knees. The man in front of him moved to block his strike, and Michelle used his two-handed grip to reverse direction and stab up, catching the man with a shallow but ugly cut across his face. 4. Melkinder had a table between her and Michelle, looking at him nervously. Michelle swung back to his left, knocking aside a blow he'd only heard, and stepped in to, ma to smash his pommel into his enemy's face. He was too close to stab the man, but he stabbed past him, another nasty maneuver from Second Shield, and caught the man behind him by surprise in the knee. With a roar, Michelle lunged forward and drove the both men backward. They hit a table and fell, and Michelle stepped back and stabbed once, twice, ending them. Three and two. 
From the corner of his vision, he saw Melkindare break for the door. He wasn't fast enough as he turned, and hot pain slashed across his side as the man behind him connected. He grimaced, batted aside the second strike, chopped down across the man's wrist, then slashed up and across his throat. One left. The bard herself. Michelle dashed across the room and out the door, frantically trying to find her before she lost herself in the market crowd outside. He saw the motion in the corner of his eye, something thrown, and turned and slashed. It was a thin cloth pouch, and it burst at his strike, sending a cloud of green dust into his face. He stumbled back, coughing and choking as pain seared his eyes and throat. Bo blinded, unable to breathe, Michel wanted nothing more than to curl up on the ground, but years of training kept him on his feet, blade up and instinctively moving into a defensive spin. It did him no good. Something blunt slammed into his head from behind. He hit the ground, his last waking thought that his masters would have been disgusted with him, forgetting that he should have made the bard his first kill. Celine was greatly displeased to find her champion missing when it came time for afternoon's hunting expedition in the gently tamed woods outside Valroyo. After last night's victory, it was vital to keep the momentum going. To keep Gaspard back on his heels for a few weeks, it would take Divine Justinia to prepare herself and commit the Chantry to direct action in the growing hostility between the Templars and the Mages. The hunting trip would give her a chance to gauge the nobles who were undecided and point them in the right direction, and show the nobles allied with Gaspard that moving against her would have consequences. Sir Michel was nothing if not punctual and responsible. He had left no message. It was clear that his absence was not intentional then. Celine dispatched Briella to find him. Then, because canceling the hunt would be an act of weakness, she called for her shining white mare, adjusted her riding skirts, and went off to battle. The lords and the ladies who rode numbered perhaps a dozen, plus their servants. Celine's guards enough to protect her even without her champion present, and the huntsmen who hunted the minute that the nobles did not care to them themselves. As they rode into the woods, carefully sculpted woods, enough to f offer fine hunting, but not enough to pose a real threat to an inexperienced rider. There was noise all around Celine, Gruff orders from the servants to their underlings, banter and laughter among the nobles, the occasional barking of the hunting dogs. The nobles were riding gowns or feathers, all of it ascended, with silver and gold and ribbons that complemented their riding mass. The servants trailed behind, always ready to rush up with a goblet of watered wine or a skewer of meat, cheese, and wine-soaked fruit for a rider more interested in eating than hunting. Celine rode in icy silence, a polite smile frozen upon her face, in her agitation while ordering the search for Michelle. She had neglected to take her tea before she had left, and her nerves felt simultaneously raw and clouded at the lack. Beside her, Grand Duke Gaspard rode in the place normally taken by Sir Michelle. You did not bring a bow, Gaspard, Marquis de Montsamad called, bringing his stallion up close. Gaspard looked back. I did not, he said. I would not wish to frighten any of noble birth with the sight of blood. Then what will you drink, cousin? Celine asked without looking over. Gaspard chuckled. You cannot expect to bring down anything without a bow, Lord Chantral called over. He was flushed and awkward in the saddle. If need be, Gaspard still said, smiling, I shall use a feather. The nobles went silent. Not your bet, not your strongest weapon, Selene observed, given how easily you were disarmed last night. The nobles laughed, but it was a nervous laugh, not the rich reaction of a crowd on her side. Had she misjudged last night's victory? Then, up ahead, the dogs bayed in pursuit. Selene turned to the group. 
Let us be off. With a nod to her guests, she spurred her mount and rode into the, rode off into the woods. The no, the other nobles were surprised. Celine's hunts were usually a more relaxed affair. With the nobles riding as a group to find whatever poor animal had been treed or cornered by the hounds, and then finishing the beast off with bows or blades. The exchange with Gaspard had shaken her, though, and she needed to disruption. She needed the disruption to gather herself for the next exchange. Her house pounded through the woods. Her horse pounded through the woods, quickly losing e the others as each noble found a different route through the trees, trying to reach the quarry first. Then the clop of hooves behind her proved her wrong. It was a heavy horse with an experienced rider. Rather than appear to flee, Celine showed her slowed her mare to a trot. Gaspard pulled abreast of her a moment later. Your Imperial Majesty. Cousin. In moments, the rest of the nobles were out of earshot, and the pair rode along the easy and well-maintained trail. It would have been a waste to bring my bow in any event, Gaspard said after a time. Are you that incompetent a huntsman? Celine asked. Gaspard chuckled. <laughs> no, but these woods are so tamed, practically a park. I prefer the hunting lines. A pity. You won't be visiting Duke Ramac to hunt this winter, then. Actually, Ramac invited me late last night after the ball, Gaspard said, his voice going hard. He said that the forest had grown so dangerous that he welcomed the company of a man of honor. Oh, stop, Celine said in irritation. There's nobody but us around. Gaspard was silent beside her for a moment. Then he burst out laughing. Maker's breath, Celine, he slapped his leg. You've never lacked for courage, I'll give you that. Were you a man, you'd be leading the armies yourself. Is that why you must plot against me, Gaspard? She asked, looking over. Because I'm not a man. He actually seemed to think about it. No, he finally said. The real problem is that you aren't me. You people are, Gaspard. Celine shook her head. At least he was honest in his folly. They came to a clearing, and Celine pulled up her mount. You have Mont Samad, and now Chantral, and you claim to have Ramak, among others. Gaspard shrugged. It would seem the feather went too far. You would threaten or lay to gain the throne? Now? Absolutely. Celine gestured angrily. You better than anyone should know that the mages and the Templars will be at war within a season until we can prevent it. They certainly will. I don't see that your radiance has done anything to stop it. And I don't see, Grand Duke, that invading Ferelden will help. She glared at him. Had you killed Ban Tegan, our soldiers would have been dying for your folly by spring. A good war unites the Empire. Maybe we can let those idiots in the Chantry in the Circle kill people outside our borders instead of inside them. Gaspard reached up and, to Celine's surprise, removed his mask. It had been years since she'd seen his full face. His features were so hawk sharp, sharp and rugged, and he spent enough time outdoors to have tan lines along the edges of where his mask normally sat. It was effectively a challenge. After a moment, Celine pulled her own mask free as well. He gave a small nod still smiling. You're right, you know, he said. We do need a strong empire right now. We cannot afford to play game to play games while war looms. And yet you yourself play games, inflaming our relationship with Ferelden and assuming that I sit idle while the chantry breaks around us. Gaspard raised an eyebrow. 
your seeding powder power to Justinia. I am giving the Chantry one chance to repair itself before I must write my name into history as the Mad Empress who bathed or lay in the blood of its people. He shook his head. You always cared too much about what history would say, Celine. Then he leaned forward. Marry me. It took her by surprise, and she knew the shock showed on her face. She damned him for bullying her into removing her mask. You presumed much, cousin. You've got steel in your spine, Celine. His voice carried no mockery, no humor. I admire that. Your wife killed my mother, for which your father killed her, Gaspard said with no particular heat, and then died himself, likely because of the poison stiletto Callienne always had up her sleeve. And that was the game, played faithfully by your side and mine. If you wish to dwell in our bloody history instead of saving her lay, you are less than a woman I think you are. He let out a breath and looked at her with a small smile. I thought you were out of the game once your parents were dead. So did Duke Bastien, and so did Duke Germain. We were all wrong. He gestured around at the woods, taking in all of her lay with a sweep of his arm. You care about the university, the treaties, the balls and banquets. I don't. He smiled again, a predator's smile. But I can keep Orlay safe, no matter how much blood it takes. Together! We can save this empire. The fact that they were distantly related meant little, and in truth, such a marriage would bring all of Orlais together. Celine actually considered it for a moment, staring at Gaspard while he sat unmasked on his great warhorse, proud and rugged. But finally, she, took, she shook her head. I need your wisdom and strength in defending an empire, Gaspard. I do not need a husband. He shook his head. I had to ask, he said with a shrug. Then, with a speed that belied his size, he kneed his horse over to her. His hand came down on her shoulder. Your guards are out of earshot, and your champion seems to be indisposed, Celine, he said, grimacing. I had no part in your mother's death. I find the whole damn thing distasteful and fat, but I do know how to arrange a hunting accident. Celine's hand wrapped around his wrist, and he cried out in pain, then lurched back. Smoke rose from his arm, and the fine cloth was scorched. He clutched the injured wrist to his chest. I took the throne at sixteen, Gaspard, after your wife killed my mother, she said pointing up her hand and showing him a glittering ruby ring that crackled with fire. And no, I have no wish to discuss our family's bloody history. I know it quite well, thank you. With a twitch of her fingers, she slid a knife free from her from a hidden sheath on her arm. It crackled with it crackled with fire as she raised it. And I have not ruled Orlais for twenty years with balls and banquets. His hand went to his sword and for a moment they were both still. He moved, and Celine lashed out, trailing a line of fire across his forearm as his blade cleared its sheath. She kneed her horse out of range and held, held herself low. The reach from his blade put the odds in his favor, but if she had done enough injury to his sword arm. Then in the distance, the hounds bayed again. Gaspard glanced in that direction, and then sighed and dipped his head in a brief bow. Just remember, cousin, everything that happens, you could have avoided with wedding vows. He sheathed his sword. She could raise the alarm right then. She knew. Some of Gaspard's nobles were hardened loyalists, but some would blanch at drawing steel on an empress. She could have her cousin in shackles as soon as her guards arrived. But if she did, Orlais would be at war before the sun set. He slid his mask back on and, still holding his burnt arm close, rode back out of the clearing. Celine shook her head and slid the knife back into its sheath. Indisposed, 
she murmured. We'll need to find Sir Michelle. Briala snuck out of the palace and left her mask, along with her fine fur cloak and one of the hidden cash she used for such purposes. Then, as just another elf, one of the dozens serving the merchants and caravan drivers in the market district, she began looking for word of Sir Michel. The most famous spies in Orlais were bards. They were legendary for their ability to ferret out information, to lay intrigue and dissemble with skill enough to turn nobles to their purposes. They were invited to play despite this, and sometimes even because of it. The lords and ladies who played the game always fancied themselves cunning enough to match wits with a master of lies and learn something from the exchange. But even as the bards outplayed the nobles, they were watched. They were famous. They were legendary. Briala was just another elf in the market, and the elves were everywhere. She learned from an elven boy unloading spices that Chernieu was expecting a poor harvest this year. An old elven woman washing cloth had gotten soaked in the rain mentioned that the merchants in Valfermin thought that something strange was going on at Edmont Fort Fortress. And after Bria Briella plied him with kind words and a smile, a human coach driver mentioned that Comte Chantral had been driven to a meeting at Grand Duke Spot's estate that very morning. Briella watched, walked, and watched, and listened waiting for the lead that would point her in the right direction. As a child, Briala had been silent and watchful, fixing ten-year-old Celine's hair while the dowager Marquis Mantillon and Duke Prosper, Celine's mother's cousin, had dined with Celine's parents. They had been talking about hunting and how they expected various nobles to do when the season had opened. Duke Prosper had said that Ferdinand and his daughter would have trouble catching anything, since Ferdinand's brother, Megrin, had ruined the family bow. It seemed silly and pointless to Rubriel. Then Prosper had said that Lady Celine would have a chance to try her hand at hunting the Golden Lion, and Briella knew how strange that was. Because Celine had only barely begun the archery lessons Lady Mantillon had suggested to help Celine's posture, and while Briella had never seen a lion, she was certain that they were too dangerous to fight. But Celine's breath had caught as Duke Prosper said it, and Lady Mantillon and Celine's parents had looked at the girl, and Briella had looked past them, carefully not making eye contact as her father had taught and seeing the crest of Celine's family, the Valmonts, a golden lion on a field of purple, and she had realized that the humans had not been really talking about hunting at all. She had remembered how her mother had argued with another elven servant before Briella had become Celine's ha handmaiden, how the other servant had said that Briella would work in the kitchens instead of, and her own daughter would serve Celine but the next morning, the servant was gone, and everyone was talking about how she had been caught stealing from Prince Reynid's purse. Briella's mother had said nothing, but had told Briella to be very careful, to obey Celine in everything, and to become the human noble's girl's friend. Listening to the nobles talk about hunting for the throne of Orlais, Briella had only then realized how much her mother had done. Stupid knife eared whore! Back in the present, Braille watched as a human seamstress yelled at her elven serving girl. The girl blushed, staring at her shoes, while all around the market men grinned and elves found elsewhere to look. Briella consoled herself by noting that a few of the merchants themselves were elven. Though still rare, elven merchants with unique guilt goods were allowed into the upper class market and Celine had declared threats against them to be unseemly and distasteful in her last visit. Slowly, but surely, Briella's people were gaining ground. It had been Celine who had taught Briella to watch, since a girl, especially an elven girl, 
could not act as a man did. A man who acted quickly and aggressively was praised as bold and daring. A woman who did the same was foolish and or desperate. As an elf and a commoner, Briao could not even defend herself from insult or assault, at least not, wearing, not while wearing the Valmont family servant's mask. Her strength lay in her invisibility, in the way the nobles she served would say such things to her to each other in the little noble's code of metaphors and euphemisms, never guessing that she understood what they were saying and was passing every word to Selene. As she had watched Selene's family play the game, Riala had trained in the greatest weapons a weighty possessed, her eyes and ears. It had been Briala who had held Selene when her mother had died. A hunting accident, the nobles all said, but Briella had known what hunting meant by then, and Duke Prosper had wept openly as he promised Selene and her father any support he had to offer. It had been Briella who crept out of the shadows outside the smoking room and listened for Selene on the night before Duke Prosper and Selene's father, Prince Reynard, had gone off to pay a visit to Duke Bastien de Gloisin a man whose daughter had arranged for the hunting accident. It had been Briella who had seen the tiny wound on Prince Reynard's arm when he returned from the visit to Duke Bastien, where Bastien's daughter had died in a hunting accident herself. The wound had grown darker and fouler until it claimed Celine's father's life, and which all the servants whispered to have been poisoned. For all that the story would always be that Prince Reynard died, had died of illness. And it had been Briella who had helped Selene, sixteen, hollow-eyed, with both her parents dead, when Duke Prosper had been called away by Emperor Florian himself. Briella had dressed Selene for the balls, badgering the servants to learn what other ladies would be wearing, and giving Selene a tiny edge where she could. Brielle had stood to serve refreshments while Celine hosted the son of Comtesse Genevieve, and then the son of Lady Montillon herself, helping with tiny suggestions given through gestures learned from the Orlesian bards as Celine charmed the young men and won their support in her fight for the throne of the greatest empire in the known world. Brielle had seen the flicker of boredom beneath the mass of Genevieve's son when Celine's back was turned, and with a tiny gesture, had guided Celine to be louder and more daring in her speech, catching the boy's attention. Briella had seen how Lady Montillon's son kept stealing glances at Prince Reynard's sword on the wall, and had convinced Celine with a single look to turn her words to military history and capture young Mant Lord Montillon's heart. Briella had been the one Celine hugged in fierce delight when Lady Montillon extended the invitation to Celine for the first time since the death of her parents. Remembering the warmth of victory only made Briella's current frustration mount. She spent an hour in the market, but heard nothing of Sir Michel's whereabouts. Wherever he had gone, he had not gone as Celine's champion. Wherever he was, he was in danger. Michel had never been anything except loyal. And for him to simply abandon Celine now was unthinkable. She had found nothing untoward in his background, nothing that anyone could use as leverage to turn him to their cause. He had no living family and came from a minor branch of the Chevins. Even if the Chevin family cared, Etienne Chevin was one of Celine's closest allies. No, it was something else. And Michelle was either in trouble or, as only a minor lord, he was already dead. When the stakes in the game were high enough, anyone who stood near the nobles without sufficient rank to protect themselves was in danger. Briella had learned that lesson well. Hush, Bria, Celine said softly from the other side of the curtain. I can hear you breathing, and it's absolutely vital that you be quiet right now. Briella pulled the red velvet curtain aside. Her hands shook as she did. 
There was a pool of red on the floor of the reading room, staining the rich Navarin carpet. It had spread almost to the curtain. At the other, at the other end of the pool were Briella's parents. Then Celine stepped in to block Briella's view. Her hands were warm on Briella's arms. Assassins. They killed all the servants, and they could be back soon. But why? Briella asked. She tried to look past Celine's shoulder, but Celine blocked her view again. Why would they do this? You were meeting Lady Matillion. She was supposed to help you. It's like what happened to mother and father. Celine's eyes filled with tears. She wiped her eyes, a ring glittering on her finger. Lady Montillon has agreed to support me, but Emperor Florian doesn't approve, I think. They must have been trying to find me. But they knew you were gone for the evening. It was hard for Briella to think. I heard them talking when I did. They said to hurry, that you would return soon. If they knew, they... Briella was stammering. You met Lady Montillon in secret. No one knew you were going, except Lady Montillon herself. She met Celine's eyes. She sent them. Bria. The reading room was too hot, the air sticky with the smell of copper. Gaspard has no idea you are still in the game. He, th he thinks the throne is his. He'd have no reason to send assassins after you now. And if they came from him, they might have known you were visiting Lady Mantillon, but they wouldn't have known when you'd be home. They could only know that if she had sent them. To... to keep her meeting with you secret. Tears rolled down Celine's cheeks. If she did this, Mega, Bria, I'm so sorry. Never thought you need to go. She wiped her tears again and twisted the ring on her finger in agitation. They'll kill you if you find if they find you, Bria. You must hurry. Where? Briella stepped back in fear. Her foot slipped. The trail of red had reached her. She hung on to the curtain to keep from falling. I've lived here my whole life, mistress. Where am I supposed to go? Go to the Dalish. Celine's voice carried the brisk certainty of command. The part of Briella's mind that had still worked noted that she was impersonating her mother's voice. You've a brilliant mind, and you know the court of Orlais better than any elf alive. They'd be fools not to take you in, and... Use what you've learned. You want me to try and find the Dalish? Mistress, I can't even... You can. And you will. For me, Bria. You will live for me. Do you understand me? Celine lunged forward. Briella flinched, and then Celine's lips were crushed against hers. For just a moment, everything else vanished, and the whole world was the heat of Celine's body against her. The smell of her face paint. The taste of her lips. Celine pulled her in tight. <coughs> Arms wrapped around her waist and then pushed her away. Take my cloak and the old mask I wore last autumn. The cloak will hide your ears and you can get a coach. Act like me and get as far as you can. After that, Celine fumbled with her hair and then angrily yanked something free. After that, sell this and buy passage to the Dales. Celine shoved Lady Montillon's jeweled hair clip into Briella's hand so hard that it cut her palm. It was late in the afternoon by the time Briella's contact arrived at the cafe where she waited. She met him each month, and usually just shared information. But today, with no leads on Sir Michel, she was ready to beg a favor. Finally. A cloaked man walked into the cafe, his face hidden beneath the hood and his movements fluid and compact, like a hunter moving through the woods. 
He stalked to Briella's seat in silence, gliding through the room and noticing the curious looks from the cafe's patron. From the cafe patrons. He sat down at Briella's table. In the gentle afternoon light, Briella could just make out the tattoos that marked his face. Among the Dalish, they were known as Velislin, blood riding. Bella. Blessin, she said with relief. Anathara, Dalin, he said in perfect elven, and then grinned. What in sweet Selassie's name is wrong with you? Briella followed the Falassin outside. Neither elf spoke. She had learned to trust his sciences. That serenity and patience was part of being Dalish, living outside the world of the Shemlin, as the Dalish elves called humans. Or at least, it was, according to Falassin. Brielle had made it as far as Halam Shiral with her disguise, and the money she had received for the hair clip. The city was the ancient home of the Dales, of the elves, and the Dales beyond the city gave the Dalish their name. If not for Fel Felison, she would have fallen to the human bandits who had found her alone on the road. They had died to a man killed by the first elf Briella had ever seen strike a human. She had seen in that moment a world where she didn't need to bow her head and try to smile when the coachman grabbed her at her while she walked by. She'd seen a life without having to remind herself that rabbit was better than knife ear. She'd seen a world where nobles didn't send out assassins to kill her parents. And then, over a dinner of venison and brown bread, Falassin had listened to her story and told her that if she wanted that world, she needed to go back to Selene. She had never made it to the Dalish camp. Blassen stopped in a park in the center of a merchant district. He ignored the bench, stepped onto the lawn, and leaned against a tree. Tamed, he said, but better than that wretched building. How do you stay indoors all day? Practice. You aren't supposed to be on the grass, Briella said looking around uncomfortably. If anyone sees you... Now scandalous, he said, smiled, the tattoos on his face curling around his violet eyes as he did. How goes the game between your empress and her... cousin? Brother? Cousin. Well, close to a cousin, although... Details, Dullin. Blasson waved absently. You know how I feel about details. I do. Briella took a, a breath. Flassen's attitude seemed closer to a court fop than the ancient figure of wisdom she had expected, but he had taught her as much as Selene in the years she had known him. I've gotten Selene to help the elven merchants, and she's gotten them to into the universities as well, but she is also attempting to get the Chantry to deal with the tensions between the Templars and the mages, which has left her vulnerable. Rather foolish of her. Flassen picked at the bark of the tree. Why would she give up power to the religious people? Even the Shemlin have to know that's a terrible idea. She hopes to keep it a quiet, internal matter, said Briella. The Circle of Magi and the Templars are also controlled by the Chantry. Also a terrible idea. Flassen plucked off a bit of bark, popped it into his mouth, and chewed. What are you doing? The Dalish know many medicinal remedies that the humans have forgotten, Flassen said, chewing. Certain types of bark can be chewed to ease headaches. He paused. Not this kind, though. Sadly, this is just bark. Briella shook her head. It was pointless to enrage him when he was in one of those these moods. How would you solve the problems between the mages and the Templars? Wait for them to get tired of killing each other. Flassen took the chewed bark out of his mouth, squinted, and stuck it back on the tree. That might take too long, revered teacher. It will happen eventually, Delen. Flassen opened his eyes. My name, among our people, means slow arrow. It comes from a story in which the god Fenharel was asked by a village to kill a great beast. He came to the beast at dawn, and saw its strength, and knew it would slay him if he fought it. So instead, he shot an arrow up into the sky. 
The villagers asked Fen Harel how he would save them, and he said to them, Why did I say that I would save you? And he left. And the great beast came into the village that night and killed the warriors and the women and the elders. It came to the children and opened its great maw. But then the arrow that Fen Harel had loosed fell from the sky into the great beast's mouth and killed it. The children of the village wept for their parents and elders, but still they made an offering to Fen Harel of thanks, for he had done what the villagers had asked. He had killed the beast with his cunning, and a slow arrow that the beast never noticed. Brella thought about the story for a moment. Her teacher would disapprove if she jumped to conclusions. Fen Harel, the trickster, never truly on anyone's side. Ben Harrell was a sneaky bastard that way, according to the old stories, Blasson said. And you are the slow arrow. Blasson smiled. I hope so, he shrugged. It may be that your empress cannot stop this war. Perhaps the mages and the Templars will destroy each other, and when that foolish and inevitable war comes, the Shemlin will be weak enough for the elves to retake the Dales. We'll find out someday. Today, you are helping the elves who live under the rule of this empire. Let that be enough. I am concerned about Selene's champion, Braille stood. He has disappeared, and I cannot find him. Braille looked around and lowered her voice. Can you help me? I know a few tricks, yes, Flassen laughed. You have something of his. Something he held or war? Smiling, Briello held out a tall, yellow feather. And that is chapter three of the Masked Empire. Ah. <laughs>